for a couple of nights we're live. So. All right, looks like we're ready to go here. So you guys passed the first tent test and actually made it to Ballroom B. That's a hike from the uh, expo area for sure. Shed some of those barbecue pounds. So before I say who's who, I bet you guys can figure out who the DevOps and uh, IT ops guy is uh, is on the stage here. <laughs> so I'm trying to make it hard for you. <laughs> I'm Al Sadowski. I'm the research director for our service provider channel, and uh, Donnie here is from the uh, obviously the development DevOps and IT uh, group at 451. And we've got about 40 minutes, and we're going to take you through uh, what we call the OpenStack Pulse. So it's kind of our uh, analysis of what we see around OpenStack. So. Okay, no, he'll, he'll be back up in a little bit. Um, so we have 15 different channels, and when we first started covering OpenStack a little over three years ago, it was really in the two channels that Donnie and I now represent, because uh, that was where all the business was, service providers and, uh, and in the DevOps space. And then as the cloud marketplace guys started plugging in OpenStack, we started to see more in our cloud transformation space, and now pretty much every channel we represent is, uh, has some sort of impact to OpenStack, and probably you can argue that all of these uh, touch OpenStack in some way. So we uh, publish an annual report called the OpenStack Pulse. We've been doing it for three years now. Uh, we covered the, uh, how the platform has evolved. We talk about timely topics we've covered. You know, is, is containers a friend or a foe of OpenStack? And, and we'll go into that a little bit more. We talk about the different distros and the distro wars. A lot of enterprises are trying to figure out, okay, I'm going to distro route, which one? We've been tracking the community growth and uh, the overall market size. We keep uh, tabs on the business models. We'll get into that a little bit. And uh, we obviously speak to a lot of enterprises and get their insights on where they are with OpenStack and talk about their uh, deployment stories. We have a big panel of, of enterprise uh, end users and we do surveys, and we have been increasingly asking a lot more questions about OpenStack as it's uh, more interest. So I got two parts to the agenda here. We're going to start at kind of a high level. This is a you know bird's eye view here of uh, of Austin. So I'm going to talk about some of the trends that we're seeing in cloud in general. Talk about the market size of public cloud and private cloud, and then we'll swoop down a little uh, you know more granular uh, specific to OpenStack. And we're going to talk about OpenStack adoption. Uh, we'll get into details about the market size that we're tracking, some of the pros and cons that we hear from enterprise, our opinions. Uh, we have something called the Cloud Price Index, and I'll share some insights that we've uh, consolidated around that. And then Donnie's going to come up and uh, finish, us, finish off talking about containers and PaaS and how they are related to OpenStack as well. All right, so I'm going to start at the top. Um, so I kind of like to start a lot of conversations that I have here because as much as most of the folks here are interested in uh, cloud native apps and private cloud, the reality is that the majority of enterprises, 50, over 50%, are still, have it, still have their internal infrastructure either doing virtualization, some automation. So as much as there's a lot of hype and discussion about private cloud and public cloud, the reality is the majority of enterprises are still trying to figure out these uh, interim steps. And the reasons why they can't get to the next phase is typically not IT related. Whether it's OpenStack or a, a, a proprietary platform, it's typically not IT. I think one of the keynote uh, folks earlier, Boris, kind of touched on this a little bit. And we are seeing that 58% of the reasons why an enterprise can't get to the next phase, so if they were doing virtualization, why they can't get to automation or skip all the way to private cloud, is things like fear, uncertainty, and doubt, budget, prioritization, lack of skill set, org design is actually a big uh, issue for a lot of enterprises. They just aren't equipped to support a, uh, a cloud initiative. So non-IT, so for the service providers in the room, helping that enterprise on that journey uh, also includes some of that uh, org structure, skill set development, uh, building processes that allow somebody to operate a cloud are, are probably more important than the, uh, the mousetrap that you're going to come and, and deploy there. When we talk about what the IT pain points are, there should be no surprises here. Uh, the stuff that's in 
green and light blue are moderate and significant impacts. Security, compliance, data sovereignty, these are the top of mind issues for enterprises as far as why they're not able to get to the next phase. So again, if you're an enterprise and the vendor or service provider is coming to pitch to you and they are not mentioning security and compliance and data uh, sovereignty as part of their value prop, then you know, look, to, uh, look to others. Um, budget and cost is obviously a concern, and I'll talk a little bit later about when a distro actually could be cheaper than doing something on your own. So one of the other things we collected in talking with enterprises is they're getting an idea of their overall IT budget. Now, 29% is staffing, but you can see there that roughly 7% of, of the typical enterprise uh, spend on cloud is, is 7%, but what's good news for uh, folks here, and probably not a surprise, is that cloud services budget is actually growing. So this is 54% uh, of enterprises saying year over year their budget is going to increase for, uh, for cloud services. And when you talk about that cloud services budget, uh, this is actually from a different study, not our own internal voice of the enterprise. This is uh, something we did for, for a client. But 70% of that cloud budget, it's not just for servers and storage anymore. There's an entire suite of of spend across managed services and application hosting and security services that they're increasingly looking to get from service providers, especially in that hosting and uh, uh, service provider space. Again, something to be aware of as we build up this story a little bit. Um, the last bit of uh, overall market sizing data and that, you know, this high level view. So we track the overall size of the cloud and hosting market. Uh, this is through 2019. We get bottoms up estimates from a number of providers. And again, when I said earlier about the hype of public cloud, it's only about, or it's one sixth of the overall hosting market. I think again, the, the, uh, the keynote this morning kind of showed the overall size. Uh, infrastructure as a service is growing a lot faster than the overall hosting market, but still in comparison, it's a lot smaller. And this is not meant to be a knock on OpenStack, but that red represents the overall size of the OpenStack market. Now this is not apples to apples comparison. We're not including hardware like you would in hosting, but it, just to give you a relative size that you know, this is a, a small market overall, but you know, clear, clearly growing. In fact, it's, uh, the OpenStack service providers are growing faster than the overall uh, service provider market. So, this slide is gonna take a while to build, but as I go, I have a couple different uh, things I like to point out. So I think everybody here knows that Rackspace and NASA started this thing as an alternative to AWS, but in our opinion, that OpenStack's future is not going to be in the public cloud, it's going to be in the private cloud. Uh, there are plenty of examples of private cloud providers out there. Uh, some of them are regional, some of them are focused on specific verticals and they're finding success but the days are over where somebody's gonna build a public cloud and say, we're competing with AWS. You know, when I, I've been an analyst for a little over three years now, I came from the telco space, and when I started and I talked to uh, many, many service providers, they all said, we're like AWS. Uh, and then a, a year and a half later, it was like, we're not like AWS, and now they're all saying, we embrace AWS. Um, so OpenStack success going forward is going to be more on the, on the private side. So that's the point, that was year, year one. So year two, you know, uh, what I like to do when I stop here is this is where, you know, you can see that very faint blue over Diablo. That's the start of the tracking of a community for OpenStack. Uh, what I like to point out here about CERN is what, you know, we talked a lot, talked to a lot of people in the uh, investment community, a lot of enterprise, and they have concerns and questions about OpenStack, and they talk about scalability. And what I point out is look at a company or an organization like CERN they, I saw Tim Bell in the hallway today, 165,000 cores now running on OpenStack, and they're not even the biggest. Uh, eBay and PayPal and Walmart are at least or, or bigger than them. You heard from AT&T talk about uh, NFV today. The next year, and I think this was a very pivotal year for OpenStack, uh, they created the, uh, Rackspace and others decided to create the foundation, the OpenStack Foundation, and my opinion is that if Citrix would have created something similar around CloudStack, we'd be at the CloudStack Summit, not the OpenStack Summit. It gave OpenStack an opportunity for other companies to help invest in OpenStack, 
build the community up and uh, have a lot more investment and marketing uh, background. Uh, around that Cactus Diablo time was my first exposure to OpenStack. I was at uh, Global Crossing, had cloud strategy. We were looking for a partner. We went down to uh, San Antonio. At the time, it was not ready for a service provider uh, to build a multi-tenant public cloud with. Uh, so we you know, went, looked elsewhere. Uh, 2013 uh, was uh, when they first went to international. They had a uh, Hong Kong summit. And people should not be, uh, there's a t-shirt over here. Uh, people should not be, uh, or should think about some of these uh, organizations in China. Some of the biggest companies in the world are all based there. And there's a lot of momentum with OpenStack in China. I think two of the top 10 cities now for developers are, are Shanghai and Beijing. And then this is the, uh, the rest through Liberty as far as the size of the community. I heard today that it might now be over 50,000 members in the community. And I say a good test of success is when you have logos that your kids can recognize. And there's a lot of them here. Um, these were the, uh, this is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but these were the ones I've seen be highlighted at the OpenStack summits. So for the uh, Mataka release, for example, uh, the first logo that I'm going to be adding is uh, uh, Volkswagen. But you can see there's uh, plenty, plenty of momentum here. All right, so this is a picture of Texas Motor Speedway. And the reason that I put this here is that one of the best uh, things that NASCAR has going for it is these cars racing around the track with these advertising uh, logos all over it and people watching for hours as their favorite ones go around. And some of the most loyal br uh, brand uh, folks are people who are attached to NASCAR. I think everybody who likes Jimmy Johnson is going to go buy their uh, home improvement stuff from Lowe's. And what I did was here was kind of show the number of supporting organizations over time uh, from Austin to Liberty, now over 500 orgs. And this is the number, not the number one, but it is consistently referenced by every single enterprise as one of their reasons for interest in OpenStack is because of the major IT vendors that are backing the, uh, the company. And major IT vendors, competitors, see their competitors doing it, so they want to be involved. So it's got a, uh, a uh, snowball effect to it. But again, what I said before, if CloudStack had done something similar, uh, we might not have seen this. So this is one of the best things for OpenStack is this uh, marketing capability based on having these financial supporters. And you name the major IT vendor with over a billion in revenue, they're pretty much uh, represented here at, at OpenStack nowadays, except for Microsoft, but maybe within the next year or so. So we have this uh, Voice of the Enterprise panel, and we have uh, a number of enterprises across the globe that answer our surveys. And this was our software-defined infrastructure survey that we just finished in the fourth quarter. And we asked organizations where they were with their implementation of OpenStack. Now, these, these figures are not exactly what was shared this morning by the foundation as far as their survey, but we see that 18% are in use and another uh, 12 and 11, whatever that equals, 25% are either doing pilots or planning to, 58% no plans. Uh, so I think the survey takes a different path to how they come up with their numbers, and that's fine. But from our enterprise perspective, uh, their 18% are, are doing stuff in something other than a pilot. And just to put this into perspective, and that OpenStack number across the bottom is the same numbers as the previous page, but just to give you a perspective of overall server virtualization, a very different story where 88% in use, only 5% not planning to do it. So again, the majority of people are still trying to figure out virtualization and are not ready uh, to adopt uh, OpenStack to do something like private cloud, for example. So again, I just wanted to provide that balance. We're not an OpenStack. Uh, fanboy, we're not saying it has no pulse, we're just trying to keep a balanced view of what OpenStack is. So, so further good news for OpenStack, so this is the overall spend discussion. So we saw that picture of the overall spend and it showed that 6.9% uh, of enterprise were planning to increase their cloud spend. They are either going to, 60% are going to keep the same budget for OpenStack and 40% are actually going to increase their spend with OpenStack. So this is a, a good news story for, uh, for the folks that are deploying. One, they're either happy with what they got, maybe they found it a little complex, so they're staying there, and uh, another 40% figure, you know what, what we're doing is pretty good, and we're gonna add to it. So where are they buying from? 
So that you got options. You can go get a distro. You can talk to a service provider and get managed services. You can do it yourself. Things that might fall into other are a converged hardware platform. It could be uh, a SaaS-based management platform that now exists. But when we ask them where are you going to consume OpenStack from, the distros is typically what we are hearing, 38%. I know in the past there were some discussions about uh, is the distro dead? And according to the enterprise that we're talking to, uh, that is the favorable thing. Initially, they were going the DIY route. They were kicking the tires. They figured this thing is, is, is worth investing in, but they want indemnity. They want support. So now they're looking for the distros to uh, provide that. So if you're in Austin and you're shopping for cowboy boots, there's a ton of different options, colors, textures, manufacturers, et cetera, uh, that you can choose from. And when, you, uh, when enterprises are looking at OpenStack, as far as their de uh, decision criteria for who they're going to pick, price, obviously, uh, long-term support. Enterprises want to deal with companies that are going to be around for a while. Uh, there's a couple of... Uh, uh, I, my first summit was the Portland summit for Grizzly, and there were some vendors that were well-known at that point that are not here anymore. They've either went out of business or were acquired. So it's an important uh, decision criteria for an enterprise. They want to make sure that the choice they make is going to be there for, for a long period of time. Existing relationships is a big deal. If you're already dealing with a major SI and they're your partner, chances are you're going to go build a private cloud using an SI. If you are using one of the major uh, Linux distros and they happen to also be doing OpenStack, chances are you're going to be talking to them about uh, OpenStack. If you're using a proprietary virtualization software, they also have an option for you to make the journey to OpenStack with them as well. Uh, reputation to community is a big deal as well. They like to know that those vendors are involved, so you, that's why a lot of these vendors like to say, you know, that they're, they're the third, fourth, fifth ranked uh, uh, code contributor and things like that. Um, it's something that uh, a lot of enterprises look at when they're making a purchase decision. So the next area I'm going to focus, I'm going to move over to our market sizing data. It's something we've been doing for a while. So we have this OpenStack market monitor. We get bottoms up estimates from a number of vendors. We have over 60 now that we include in our estimate. So I'm going to talk about what's in scope, but as important as what's not. So service providers that are using OpenStack for the core of the service. Uh, all the consulting, the, the uh, development services, the distros, uh, training services, uh, all of that is included. Um, and if they have a product, even if it's hardware-based, that was purpose-built for OpenStack, uh, that is included. What's not, if you're a generic hardware provider, so you're building servers or storage or networking hardware, we don't include that in our numbers. That's why that number looks small in comparison to the overall hosting market, because we don't include the hardware. And PayPal and eBay, that, you know, they're using OpenStack to run their businesses, but we're not including their revenue in this as well. So in that market sizing, there's really three major buckets. There's the service providers, there's the cloud management platforms, and then there's the products, distros, and management. And you can see the further breakdown of there. For the first time this year, we actually split out public versus private based on from feedback from some of the folks uh, that are involved with OpenStack. And then the distros uh, is probably the fastest growing area. So this is our market sizing. So 2015 was the first time that it exceeded a billion, and we expect by 2018 that it's 3.3 billion, growing at a 31% CAGR. So again, in comparison, it looks small, but it's still a, a healthy growth rate in comparison to uh, the overall market. Nearly 80% of that number is service providers, and there's one major service provider that is the majority of that, but that share goes down by 2019 to 75%, and that's a good story. It's the fact that there's more contributions to the overall market. Uh, the, the most growth, as I mentioned, is coming from the distro area. And right now, the mix of service providers between public and private, 56% public cloud, 44% private cloud, and over time, that mix is actually going to uh, tilt more towards the private cloud. Uh, we, our research shows that the majority of uh, enterprise spend is more on the private side than the public side. So now I'm going to pivot over to pricing. 
we put together an RFP. Now, you know, you can shoot holes in the requirements that we came up with, but what we came up with was an RFP. We sent it out to over 40 different uh, service providers, distro providers, and asked them to basically give us a price. So it, it was the space, the power, all the hardware to build the private cloud. You know, they could pick the hypervisor. It needed all these orchestration requirements to run 500 virtual machines. We said they're running all the time, and you pick the premium operating system that you, you wanted. Uh, we wanted everybody to respond. So based on that, we got a, a, a range of responses. And what I'm gonna go through is uh, a, a specific comparison about DIY versus a uh, distro. Now you would expect that if you had the same number of engineers and you had the same software and infrastructure, that a distro obviously is gonna be more expensive. Makes sense because you're paying for a, a license fee. However, what our research shows is that if you can save 45% of your engineering costs, the distro actually turns out to be a better total cost of ownership for you. And the, the issue is OpenStack developers are very expensive. In some cases, double the cost of something comparable. So distro can be cheaper than DIY. The other thing I'm gonna compare is when managed services can be cheaper than self-managed. Now you would expect that managed services is typically going to be more expensive than if you were running OpenStack and had uh, the software and infrastructure on your own, okay? But what we found out is that if you have a, balance, a tipping point somewhere where 100 virtual machines are managed by an engineer, it's actually a better value at that point to do managed services. Now when we collected managed services uh, responses, uh, the, it, the smallest to the highest, there was a 14x difference between those. The most expensive came from a couple of SIs. Uh, we don't uh, give out specific uh, vendor information, but the SIs were, were higher. But in general, that if you needed more than one engineer for every 100 virtual machines, uh, managed services was actually a cheaper route to go. Donnie is up next. And uh, Donnie's going to go through a couple slides here and talk about... Uh, uh, containers, PaaS, as it's related to OpenStack, and then I'll be back. All right, thanks, Al. So for those of you who arrived late, uh, I'm Donnie Burkholz. So I lead the development DevOps and IT Ops channel. And yes, hence my camouflage. Helps me fit in at the, at the bars. Um, so I'm gonna talk through a bunch of stuff around container adoption, both in general, but also specifically within the OpenStack community, and then talk a little bit about uh, what people are doing with those containers, right? In terms of workloads and uh, things a little bit more complex than a single container because we can't build an application with one container anymore. So to kick this off, uh, Al talked a little bit about our private cloud index and about the ratio of VMs to engineers and the comparable price points for private cloud, for uh, proprietary clouds versus for OpenStack. And some of the numbers he talked about make a lot of sense for enterprises. Um, the difference, I think, comes in when we start talking about the ratio of VM to engineer that we're seeing in some of the huge clouds, whether private or public cloud providers. And some of the numbers that I hear range up to things like 10,000 VMs per SRE out there. So when you start thinking about the cost point, you can imagine once you get to that kind of number, the salary per VM becomes incredibly small and other things become much more important factors. And as we move toward more and more distributed applications, more and more um, containerization for these apps, we'll start to see more people, I think, moving toward ratios along those lines because you have to have a lot more automation. You can't be doing the sort of manual maintenance anymore once you get to uh, container scale, microservices scale, or um, things along the lines of serverless scale. So first, I just wanted to show you a, a little bit of info that's uh, not from our surveys. One of the things I really like to do is go out there and look at developer traction for things on all these different forums. Uh, one of them that you're probably familiar with is called Stack Overflow. And if you go out there and you look at the number of tagged questions per month for a lot of different container technologies, you can get a really good sense of how important Docker has been to container adoption as a whole. That blue line there is Docker. The green one happens to be Kubernetes. 
And so we're talking here about containers at the, is, is the Docker level, but then container orchestration and management is where we start getting into things like Kubernetes. And once you start scaling containers, once you start automating containers, uh, it becomes really important to have some kind of layer on top that helps you deal with all of that. And we've seen Kubernetes start to become uh, the standard there, at least in terms of developer interest. Um, in terms of corporate interest, it's a lot harder to get a good sense on that right now. Um, but that's one of the things that we're going out and doing in our surveys is asking enterprises, what are they using? Are they using Kubernetes? Are they using Mesos? Are they using Swarm? Are they using something else? Um, and all of the other lines on there, uh, frankly, don't matter because they're all basically zero um, compared to the two I mentioned. But one of the questions that I was very curious about is like, it's great to have developer interest, and the question is, are containers really getting out there in the enterprise? And so we went out there, asked about 1,000 people in one of our cloud surveys, um, got some very interesting responses in terms of where things were. Um, and we've run this survey twice now. In the first one, we saw some pretty interesting levels of interest. And I'm showing you uh, the darker colors there are quarter three last year, the lighter colors are quarter one of last year. And over the course of two quarters, we saw production deployments double um, from, if you look at the initial plus the broad numbers there, from a uh, little over 6% to over 14%. Um, so it's not just developers who are interested in this stuff, it's enterprises who are picking it up and picking it up very quickly. And if you couple that in with people using containers in some kind of dev test point right now, you see, uh, surprisingly in our large numbers of enterprises who have picked this stuff up already, considering Docker is just over, uh, I think, three years since it was open source at this point. Did I make you miss your picture? Should we go back? We can go back later. And so I want to dig in a little bit deeper, get closer to OpenStack, closer to how these things are being used in a cloud environment. And the numbers are a little bit smaller on this because if you have 1,000 people taking in the survey and you start slicing by container use and you start slicing by OpenStack, you suddenly you're down around a couple hundred. Um, but they are still big enough that I think they produce some interesting data points, um, especially when you're talking about large differences. If you start talking about small differences with small numbers, I don't really believe that. But once you have large differences with smaller numbers, that can work. And so. What we're seeing is that container use today is primarily used in private cloud, which I found very surprising. Um, but when you think about who we're surveying, it's enterprises, it's not just a bunch of Bay Area startups picking up this stuff and throwing it in uh, their public cloud of choice. It's people who need to use this for business workloads. And today, they're putting it mostly on-prem. But as more and more people expect to pick up containers over the next couple of years, that's gonna change. They're gonna be putting it in all kinds of different venues depending on the workload, depending on the application, um, and depending on the portability requirements they have, right? A lot of people are gonna want something on private cloud. They'll also want it in a hosted private. Um, they may also want it in public, and they're gonna be picking up containers in all of these places. Now, in terms of what they're doing with the containers, I think this is probably the most important question, and I, I tie it back to thinking about OpenStack a number of years ago where People would go out there and they'd install an OpenStack cloud and they'd say, now what, right? I've got compute, that's cool. But somebody sold it to me and I'm not really sure what to actually do with this thing now that I have it. Um, and so containers have been at that point and we wanted to learn a little bit more about what people are doing with them. And you can see that uh, the top five workloads I showed here, uh, they're mostly infrastructure workloads, right? App dev, technical, technical computing, which would be things like uh, Genomic sequencing, for example, is a really good use case for containers because it's small things quickly piecing together chunks of DNA, um, scaling up and down as required. And web servers, right? Nothing really surprising there. Now, containers in the OpenStack universe is something that I really want to spend some time talking about because I think presumably this is why you're interested in containers, right? Because how, how are they relevant to OpenStack? And so when we go out there, um, I want to compare this to containers in the wild as a whole, if you will. And so if you take a look at containers as a whole out there, uh, we surveyed about 500 people for this one, you can see pretty similar numbers, right? Production workloads around 15%, right? The last one was 14%, this one is 16 and a half. Um, it's a slightly different audience we asked. But so you can see production's about 15%. Um, if you start adding in pilots and dev test use cases, you end up around 35% total of the enterprises that have at least started playing with containers at this point. Now, if we slice that down to just the OpenStack people, uh, we, we see something very interesting. 
take a look at that light orange graph on the, on the very top there. There are tons of OpenStack using enterprises who are using containers in production today. In fact, over half of them, which I found shocking. Now, it doesn't say, it doesn't mean they're using them in their OpenStack cloud, but it does mean they're using them somewhere. In fact, chances are they're not using them in OpenStack right now. Uh, they're probably using a container service or something else because what we see in general is that, you know, companies, unsurprisingly, they have a technology adoption stance. They tend to be early adopters or late adopters or somewhere in the middle. And people who have installed their own OpenStack clouds are pretty likely to be fairly early adopters at this point. Um, and so they also pick up other new technologies like containers as soon as they see a, a business use case for them. Now, like I said, the number of, of people we're able to slice down to for OpenStack was pretty small. We only had about 80 people on that one. But the size of that difference is so dramatic that I tend to put more faith in it than I might otherwise. Now, one of the things that I've always wondered about is how are people using these relative to VMs? I had always kind of assumed that everybody just stuck a container inside of a VM because they wanted more security, more isolation. Um, and so we wanted to get out there and ask, what are you doing with them? And it came down to three main alternatives, right? Are you running them inside the VM? Are you replacing VMs with them? Or are you creating new workloads that run in containers rather than VMs? And I saw this really interesting split where it's not at all the majority of people who are running them in, in the VMs. It's the most common style, the most common approach. But the majority of them are actually using them either instead of a VM or um, separately from a VM in some other way. Now, if we break that down to OpenStack, we again see the numbers are larger, but this is just because there's more people using containers. The pattern is exactly the same, right? If you take a look at the pattern, um, you see the biggest one running it on top of a VM and then a little bit lower as separately or replacing VMs with them. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is, again, what are people doing with containers, right? You have to, if you're building applications that are sort of cloud native or what have you, you have to be able to do something with these containers to have a good way to manage them. And I'm seeing two different approaches starting to emerge. One of them is a very un unopinionated approach built on top of things like Kubernetes and Mesos. Um, and the other one is a very opinionated approach, right? What we um, used to call and still occasionally call PaaS, right? Whether it's a platform as a service or uh, some other kind of more opinionated framework that doesn't give you quite as much flexibility. And I showed you earlier that we we're seeing about 15% of these enterprises who are using containers in prod. And the question is, so are you using orchestration? Because if you're not using container orchestration, I contend that you're not really using containers properly, right? Because you're still doing the manual management stuff that you were doing with, with VMs and logging in by hand and running top as your, as your monitoring solution. And what we saw surprisingly was only about two thirds of the people who are running containers in prod are using container orchestration. All right, the other people are still thinking about it in sort of the, the pets side of that pets versus cattle metaphor, um, which I found again, really surprising. I thought that basically everybody who had managed to put this stuff in prod would have to have some way to deal with it, but it turns out that's not the case. And so that's kind of the, un the un unopinionated platform side of things, right? People who are building up these platforms themselves from scratch. Now on the opinionated side, um, we've also gone out and asked this question, what are you using in terms of your on-prem paths? Um, where are you in terms of your adoption cycle of it? And then broke it down, OpenStack and, and everybody. And you can see that um, as a whole, so this is everybody, not just OpenStack users, the private paths is, is surprisingly popular. There's a lot of people who have rolled out some kind of a platform as a service um, on-prem. But there's even more who have done it among OpenStack users. All right, it's a really significant 20% difference there. Um, like I said, the audience is small, but I tend to believe a difference that large. Whereas some of those other numbers, I'm not really sure about like planning to implement in the next 12 months, the next 24 months, whatever. Um, somehow those plans all seem to fall apart when they encounter reality. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today in terms of container adoption as a whole increasing very quickly. And we see unopinionated frameworks, right? Like Mesos and Kubernetes starting to grow more and more in popularity. And I expect to see a lot of that over the next couple of years. With that, I'll pass it back to Al. All right, so we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, so if you were late, you still are able to get some benefit here because what I'm gonna cover is just kind of summarizing some of the things we talked about. So we're now just gonna really just focus in on uh, the reasons why enterprises are drawn to OpenStack. Vendor lock-in is something that they consistently reference. People do not want to continuously talk about these proprietary platforms. 
They like the technology. You guys all know about how it works. There's no central piece to it. It's all modular. They like that part. Open source. Again, enterprises are increasingly having this mandate about open source. We had an event in London a couple weeks ago, and two agencies of the British government were there, and both of them talked about a mandate for open source and that they're uh, evaluating OpenStack and uh, pilots right now for an internal private cloud. I showed before the pricing analysis that indicated that there is some savings uh, when you consider a distribution versus DIY. Uh, uh, people seem to think open source is going to be cheaper. There's, uh, there's examples where it's actually not, but the cost of an OpenStack developer is one of the key expenses there. Uh, we talked about that NASCAR uh, slide, but the fact that there's these major IT vendors back in the community is consistently referenced as a reason why enterprises are drawn to this community. The fact that you're not locked into just one specific hypervisor is a big deal. You have a lot of choices out there. Uh, and as far as the telcos are concerned, they're very drawn to this NFV capability based on OpenStack. You heard it today. You heard it from a lot of other telcos in the past as well. But for all the excitement there is around OpenStack, there is also some cautions as well. Uh, our research shows that the SMB community is really not as interested in OpenStack as midsize and large enterprise. And a lot of the reason is they just don't have the resources internally to do it. And oftentimes at SMB, they're likely going to deploy a SaaS solution because uh, they just don't have the IT staff to go and build something and maintain it. If you're comparing it to the biggest proprietary platform out there for uh, uh, doing support for production workloads, it doesn't compare as far as the reliability re resiliency. Uh, again, this is a, uh, something that is, is evolving over time. Uh, when we first started talking to a lot of folks about OpenStack, they thought you can go to Staples or Home Depot and buy it off the shelf. It's a shrink wrap box that says OpenStack on it. They thought it was a product. Um, it's really a toolkit. People have taken some of those tools and built products, but the, again, that's the mindset for some enterprises still. And fragmentation is still a concern. I've said in the past that, hey, we might still be in the Unix stage, and one of these uh, vendors out there is gonna take the Linux uh, version of OpenStack and run. You know, the governance of OpenStack may prevent something like that happens, but it's still a possibility. And everybody's aware of the complexity of OpenStack. There are thousands of configurable items across all the different projects to build a private cloud. It's complex to deploy. And then the limited supply of developers. I talked to a college class one time and I told them, go learn OpenStack and move to the Bay Area. You can make a lot of money. Um, and that's probably still the case. And so I'll just leave you with some summary thoughts again. If you're late, this kind of just summarizes that enterprises, they prefer private to public cloud. Uh, regardless of what they're going to deploy, security is a key thing. So again, if you're a service provider, your first or second slide of your pitch deck better talk about security uh, because it's the number one reason why an enterprise has not moved to the next phase. While OpenStack has a lot of mind share, the wallet share hasn't caught up, but uh, we showed before that it is growing faster than uh, the overall market. Uh, there's plenty of issues with the toolkit, but a lot of those issues are being addressed, and over time, you know, it's only five and a half, six years old, so it's, it's developing. I showed you before how distro total cost of ownership is actually a better value prop if you can save on, uh, on headcount. And existing relationships is going to be key for how you decide on a vendor. So if you're an enterprise looking for a distro, chances are you're gonna be talking to people you're already doing business with. Uh, as Donnie just talked about, containers is, uh, has a higher adoption in the, in the OpenStack area, and these uh, unopinionated container orchestration ideas are, uh, is, is increasing as well. So that was a lot of information we threw at you. That was our balanced and fair view of OpenStack. Thank you for uh, making it all the way from the other side of the building over here today. We appreciate your time. Thank you.